So it's my great honor to uh, give this uh, JQI seminar today. Uh, so uh, my name is Xiaoli. Uh, I'm over at the CMTC. I'm a postdoc there. And uh, today I'm going to tell you uh, our recent work on the observation of uh, single particle mobility edge in a one-dimensional system. Uh, so um, if I want to leave you with one single take-home message, it is this figure. So, uh, so we are talking about a one-dimensional bichromatic potential. So that means that we have a, a defining potential, which we call primary. And uh, there's a, a weaker detuning lattice. So uh, these two potential uh, together provide an interesting one-dimensional system in that it provides a, a rich phase diagram. Because uh, it not only has the extended phase, localized phase, but in the middle, there is an intermediate regime where both type of states can coexist. And this is the first uh, observation of such a uh, mobility edge in one-dimensional systems. So uh, uh, I'm very excited to tell you today. So if you want to learn more, uh, these are the two references uh, that you can look up some details. So uh, this uh, work is done in collaboration with uh, Shanka and uh, a former uh, CMTC postdoc Xiaopeng, now at Fudan University. Uh, experimental part of the project is done uh, carried out in uh, Emmanuel Bloch's group and uh, a primary uh, carried out by uh, his student, uh, Henrik. So uh, there are four parts of my talk. Uh, the first one is uh, some general background introduction, and uh, then I'm going to turn, on the, turn to the theory of uh, single prime mobility edge in this one-dimensional system. And I was going to tell you about this, uh, the experimental system, uh, how they observe uh, these uh, single particle mobility edge. And finally, I'm going to touch upon some implication for main body localization. So uh, some brief overview of uh, localization physics. Uh, uh, so, so this uh, quantum localization uh, started with this uh, seminal paper by Anderson, uh, which talked about particles hopping in a, a lattice with random potentials. Uh, so uh, previously, uh, people understood that uh, uh, quantum interference effects can give rise to uh, a reduced conductance, uh, which people call a weak localization. But one thing people didn't appreciate was that uh, the conductance can come to a full stop after uh, the, the critical uh, disordered strengths pass the critical disordered strengths. And this was uh, due to a purely quantum effects. And uh, uh, it was later appreciated that uh, in 1D and 2D system, uh, the, uh, it is only needed an infinitesimal amount of disorder to localize the system. But in 3D, uh, something new happens because uh, not only finite disorder is needed, but there's also the so-called mobility edge, meaning that uh, in the energy spectrum, uh, there are critical energies that separate extended from localized states. So uh, the uh, implication of uh, this uh, Anderson localization uh, later uh, evolved into something very fundamental, uh, which touches upon the fundamentals of this uh, quantum statistical mechanics. Because uh, previously, when we learn in the textbook, we are used to think of a, a system in connection to above. And uh, in that case, uh, we can set up uh, 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 various uh, hypotheses and uh, talk about ergodicity. But this is no longer true if we think about uh, isolated quantum systems. Uh, so uh, in such systems, uh, ergodicity breaking is possible. Uh, it was uh, uh, well understood that uh, it can happen in integrable systems because uh, the larger amount of uh, observed quantities will, uh, conserved quantities will give rise to uh, a, a state that is far from uh, uh, thermalization. But later on, people realized that MBL is another general example of ergodicity breaking. And uh, it behaves very differently from either thermal uh, phase and uh, single particle localized phase. Uh, so the uh, uh, theoretical uh, studies of MBL motivated experimentalists to look for signatures of MBL in uh, cold dynamic experiments because uh, that is one of the system that is uh, relatively well isolated uh, from uh, noises. Um, so, and the first uh, success was uh, in 2015 by Emmanuel Brock's group. Uh, what they did is that they uh, load uh, one-dimensional fermionic uh, particles into a lattice. And uh, uh, this is the uh, 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 lattice potential, uh, which is the one I'm going to focus on today. Uh, so it is uh, bichromatic, meaning there are two uh, potentials. So the first one, primary potential, defining the periodic lattice, and the second one, weaker detuning lattice that gives rise to uh, uh, quasi-random uh, onset potentials. So this is not the truly random case. Uh, so remember that. 
So in that paper, uh, they used uh, this lattice model to describe this experiment. There's neighbor hopping plus uh, this uh, cosine uh, quasi-random uh, onset potential. And this model, uh, uh, we have a special name for it, which is the uh, Aubrey-Andre model that was for first proposed in 1980. And uh, um, so the special property of this model is that when this uh, disorder strength delta equals to 2j, that is the critical point uh, in, a, in, a, in a phase diagram because uh, when delta is less, the system is totally extended. When delta is more than 2j, uh, the entire system is localized. Uh, so they uh, try to see the signatures of uh, member localization uh, by observing this quantity, meaning that initially they load a charge density wave states onto even sites only, and let the system evolve freely and observe how much of the initial memory is left in the final state. Uh, so this uh, n sub e is the uh, particle number in even sites, and this is the particle number in odd sites. And uh, so what they see is that when there's no disorder, uh, the, the initial memory is totally lost. The, the even odd imbalance go, uh, is gone after a long time evolution. But whenever there's finite disorder, uh, even with interaction, there's uh, some uh, residual memory uh, of the initial state is left in the system. Later on, the experiment went to 2D uh, using bosons. In this case, this is not uh, using a bichromatic elastic potential. Instead, this is uh, uh, using a grain uh, to, to pr uh, provide some uh, random uh, landscape for the particles. And the experiment that was uh, carried out was that initially they have a, a particle in the trap, and they sh uh, burn away half of the population and see, what the, uh, and, and see what's the final state. And again, see if there is any uh, memory of the initial condition. So this uh, panel tells us that uh, with, with no disorder present, then this uh, uh, initial state uh, evolved into a more or less uh, homogeneous uh, final state. But with uh, disorder uh, turned on, then there's some memory of the initial state, meaning the left part still has some more population than the right part. So this is the uh, uh, two, uh, two of the uh, most uh, 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 interesting uh, cold atom experiments. Of course, uh, we, we here have the uh, experiments in, in ion traps uh, by Chris Morano's group. Uh, uh, so, okay, so the motivation of our study is that um, uh, this is twofold. The first one is that there's a, a something subtle that was not fully appreciated before, and we want to point it out. So the first one is that the experimental system is described by this continuous model. And uh, people often map the lowest band of this continuous model onto this lattice model in the deep lattice limit, meaning that both the primary potential and detuning potential is large. Uh, there is a, a good approximation to project this, the lowest band of this model into this, band, uh, this, uh, this type binding model. And uh, these are the relations. Uh, of uh, these, uh, 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 these uh, uh, tunneling parameter and this onset potential in connection with the original uh, continuum model parameters. Uh, but this is a very special fine-tuned model in the sense that it has self-duality. If you do a Fourier transform, the kinetic energy goes to the onset energy, the onset energy goes to the kinetic energy. So this special duality gives rise to the uh, property that I mentioned earlier that V over T equal to two define a special point that separates localized from delocalized states. Here, meaning that complete localization and complete delocalization. In a spectrum, there are just no mixture of these two types. So this is a, a theoretical calculation um, for this uh, uh, AA model. Uh, so uh, what calculated here is the inverse participation ratio and uh, the dark color means the extended states, and the light color means the localized states. So you can see that uh, this axis is the eigenstate number that label all the states in the, in the spectrum. So you can see that all states localize at the same uh, disorder point. But this is uh, something that is uh, clearly missing uh, in the mapping, is that this A model doesn't have mobility edge. It's either localized or extended. But what we found is that in this continuum model, there is mobility edge, which I will tell you later. Okay, so this is one motivation for us to, uh, to work on this uh, problem. And also we want to point out that this Aubrey-Andrew model itself is not the Anderson model. 
because Anderson model talks about totally random onset potential. But this is not, uh, uh, this uh, aubrey andre model, it is not random potential. It is quasi-random, but it is not truly random. So uh, previously, some experiment uh, even claim of uh, Anderson localization in this model, which is strictly speaking is not accurate. The second motivation is that uh, the mobility edge in one-dimensional systems have been proposed in many, many scenarios. Many, many models uh, possess the single particle mobility edge in 1D. However, it has not been seen before. Yeah? Just do an experimental question. What's right. mobility edge? Mobility edge, OK. So, yeah. So yeah, it's, it is a critical energy that separates localized from uh, extended states. Uh, so, yeah, mobility edge, so look at this one, for example. This is a simulation of a 3D Anderson model. And uh, this axis is the uh, disordered strength. And uh, so for a given disordered strength, let's look at uh, W equal to 40. And we cut a line through the spectrum. So these are the, all the states that we can have in the spectrum. So instead of saying that the, all the states in the spectrum is localized, or all the states are extended, we have the possibility that we have both localized states at the band edge and extended states near the band center. So the mobility edge is defined as this point, in, which is the critical energy in the spectrum that separates localized from extended states. Yeah, sure. Uh, good. So. Um, yeah, feel free to stop uh, me uh, and uh, l let me clarify anything if I uh, didn't make it clear. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, so let me finish uh, something here. So, so basically, in one-dimensional system, people have never seen a mobility edge in the experiment. And in generally, uh, in 3D system, the mobility edge was only seen in 2015. So this is a, a very uh, uh, elusive quantity, I would say, uh, to observe in the experiment, despite so many uh, uh, wonderful theories. Okay, yeah. No. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. All, all these uh, uh, proposals are based on on, on uh, generalized or boundary model. Yeah. So yeah. Of course. Yeah. Truly random systems don't have uh, mobility edge. Infinitesimal disorder will localize the system. Okay, so uh, just uh, uh, I'm going to uh, describe uh, the, the localization physics in this uh, 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 system. So again, this is the uh, lattice, uh, so Hamiltonian. So uh, everything uh, I will talk about is defined uh, in this uh, recoil energy units. So uh, for example, I will write uh, Vp equal to eight, meaning the primary lattice uh, energy is uh, eight times this recoil energy. And uh, so, the unique property of this model is that it, exists, uh, the, it carries a single particle mobility edge. And how to characterize it in, in theory? Uh, we can calculate two complementary quantities. Uh, the first one is the inverse participation ratio, and this one is the uh, uh, normalized participation ratio. So we can calculate these two quantities for each eigenstate. And you can see that for a given eigenstate, uh, the product of these two just give rise to one over L. It's nothing special. But what's special is that when we average over all the eigenstates in the spectrum, uh, they are no longer simply connected. Uh, there is a, a, they provide complementary angles of localization physics. In particular, this average IPR is sensitive to localized states because whenever there is some localized states, it becomes finite. On, in contrast, this NPR, average NPR, becomes finite whenever there's some extended states. So we go on to pr uh, plot uh, this average IPR and average NPR for this model. We find that the point they become finite is not the same. So there are regimes in the, in the parameter space that both average IPR and average NPR is fin uh, are finite. So that means that this system indeed has a uh, uh, certain parameter range at which the spectrum contains both localized and extended states. 
Okay. So the previous plot was a uh, uh, plot of the average over, over uh, all the eigenstates. And here I'm going to show uh, 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 the, the plot uh, in terms of uh, every eigenstates. So this is the plot of uh, IPR. And uh, this axis is, again, the eigenstate number. Uh, I label all the eigenstates in the spectrum. So you can see this uh, dark area is, again, extended. This light area is, again, localized. So you can see that uh, the mobility edge clearly, for example, let's follow this line. You can see that for this detuning lattice, this part of the energy uh, eigenstates are uh, localized, but these parts are still extended. So this is the, uh, what a uh, mobility edge looks like uh, in, uh, when, when we uh, uh, zoom into the spectrum. And this is, again, uh, uh, telling us that uh, the, 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 uh, the localization transition uh, doesn't happen uh, for, 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 uh, uh, at the same place for, for a given disorder. OK, so this uh, uh, calculation tells us that there is indeed a mobility edge in the system, and we can uh, think of uh, 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 intermediate phase uh, in, uh, in the sense that before all the uh, states localize, we can have a, a period uh, at which both localized and extended states coexist. But how to see them in, in the experiment? We cannot ask the experimentalists to measure IPR or NPR. They will think we are crazy. So we have to think of uh, good observables for them. And fortunately, we can do, uh, we, we just need to ask them to do what they are already capable of doing. Just the even odd imbalance and particle expansion. But now we ask them to do particle expansion in 1D system. Previously, it was a 2D setup. So yeah. Okay, just to clarify, before we had to take an extended phase and a localized phase. Right. Are you saying that there's a third phase Yes, when you, when you tune the parameters, you will find that uh, in, in, the, uh, in, in this, uh, so, yeah, just uh, like. Yeah, it's a critical state. Critical. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, uh, right. So um, maybe let me. Yes, yes. So, um, yeah, so uh, this is a, 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 a qualitatively different uh, uh, phase. So, um, one thing is that um, here I'm plotting uh, the, all the eigenstates in the intermediate phase. And uh, we can see an uh, 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 interesting uh, self-similar spectrum um, that appears. Uh, uh, so basically, uh, if we just plot the uh, spectrum of uh, uh, localized or extended states, we will see a, a continuous uh, 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 a distribution of uh, these eigenstates. But when we look at this uh, intermediate phase, when we zoom into, for example, this part of the spectrum, we can see a self-similarity self structure that appears. So this is the uh, one uh, signature of a critical phase. Uh, and also, we can calculate the so-called uh, uh, fractal dimension, which is uh, defined, uh, it, which is the generalized uh, IPR in some sense. Uh, it is uh, defined in this way. We calculate the wave function to the power of 2Q and the integral over space. And uh, so for a one-dimensional system, if it is uh, conducting, we have this, uh, uh, so yeah, we, we can calculate average PQ and uh, it scale as uh, the system size to the minus, L, uh, minus tau power. And this, uh, this tau uh, uh, follows such a, 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 a scaling with the Q that you put in the, uh, in the calculation. Uh, let's assume Q is the integer. <laughs> so for 1D metal, we have DQ equal to 1. And for 1D insulator, DQ is 0. But if we calculate this quantity for the uh, uh, intermediate phase, we can see that it is uh, uh, in between 0 and 1, meaning it is, uh, 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 yeah, it shows the fractal dimension of, of uh, such an intermediate phase. Yeah. 
Yeah, this is uh, due to uh, finite size, and uh, it's, uh, yeah. In the Aubrey Andre model, that the, the fact that you have fractal behavior means you're sitting right at the self dual point, right? So is this is there fine tuning to get to this fractal, this multi fractal point, or if you so if you tune away from the, if you tune these parameters away from the critical the self dual point, mm -hmm. are you going to lose this fractal? Right, behavior? right. So so yeah, good question. So first of all, this is not the Aubrey Andre model. We are not sitting at a delta equal to 2t, for example. Right. Yeah, this is the, when we look at the continuum system, there is a, a finite range of parameters that we can observe this intermediate phase. But you're discretizing this, right, to get, I mean, this is, your simulation is discretized. Uh, yeah, real, yeah, solving the uh, Hamiltonian, yes. But so when uh, you say continuum, mm -hmm. that means you're retaining terms? Oh, no, 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 it, it's. Yeah. Yeah. Everything in computer is discrete. That doesn't mean yeah. the model cannot be simulated. Yeah. People who do simulations know how to handle this. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we definitely ensure the convergence of the calculation. No, I just, but I, what is the phys I, I don't understand this difference between this and the Aubrey Andre model. Like, right. Terms, yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah, good. Yeah, so you are. Yeah, you are asking me to review some answers at the end of the talk. Yeah, so basically, uh, uh, the difference is that this, this continuum model provides next neighbor hoppings right. that is uh, uh, not existent in, in the Aubrey Andre model. Yeah, that's a. Uh, yeah, 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 good, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, actually, yeah, that was uh, one of the driving questions for us to, to, to yeah, study this problem. What, what, what caused the difference, right? So, okay, so. Uh, so yeah, so we, we later realized that we just asked them to measure whatever they are capable of. They are already capable of measuring the even odd imbalance. They are already capable of measuring expansion. And it turns out that these two quantities are sufficient to pin down the intermediate phase. The reason is that this even odd imbalance, again, is sensitive to localized, phase, uh, localized states in the spectrum. And this uh, particle expansion is sensitive to the existence of uh, extended states. So when we put them together, again, we can have this, uh, 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 this uh, characterization of the system by looking at whether one of them is finite or both of them are finite. So we define localized being that this uh, particle doesn't expand and that there's finite even odd imbalance. We define lo uh, uh, extended being that there's uh, uh, totally no, uh, even all the imbalance, but there's a, 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 a particle expansion to the large extent possible. And uh, in the intermediate phase, we are seeing that there are uh, both uh, finite even all the imbalance and finite expansion. So uh, the, to do the experiment, uh, so even all the imbalance, again, load all the particles onto even sides and let it go and see what's, uh, what, uh, how much of uh, even all the imbalance is remained at the end of the day. And for this uh, particle expansion, you just uh, limit your initial state in the in middle of the system and let it expand and see how much particle, how much of the population move away from the initial uh, middle area. And uh, yeah, our simulation uh, just uh, uh, showed that for uh, this uh, extended state, uh, the even imbalance uh, fracture around zero and the uh, particle expansion goes to the largest possible extent and the uh, localized phase behave uh, as expected. And in the intermediate phase, there's a clear finite value of expansion, finite value of uh, uh, imbalance. So uh, another understanding is that when we go to uh, a shallow or a primary lattice, uh, this intermediate phase becomes even wider. So if you look at uh, VP equal to eight, uh, which was the uh, experiment that, that, uh, that was done in, in 2015 to observe MBL, uh, this intermediate phase only survived for uh, uh, the detuning lattice uh, range of 0.02, from roughly from 0.15 to 0.17. But uh, when we tune down the primary lattice to four, then this uh, intermediate phase survived for about 0.2, so uh, roughly eight, nine times larger. And uh, this is our uh, uh, theoretical understanding of this uh, intermediate phase. So now uh, I'm going to uh, tell you that uh, this uh, single particle mobility edge in 1D is finally observed. 
And uh, um, before you, uh, I show you the final, final result, uh, I'm going to show you the first uh, result we received from Munich. Uh, yeah, Shankar was uh, very uh, uh, excited and uh, contact Emmanuel and uh, ask if he can do this experiment. And uh, they did it very quickly. Uh, within, uh, within two weeks or less, they sent us this uh, 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 data. But this data is partially, only partially good news because this is what they observe. So this is their even odd imbalance and this is their expansion. But this black line is my simulation. It does not exactly match. So, so the, the partially good news because we do see a finite range of intermediate phase, but it does not agree exactly. So what happened? And later on we figure out that the experimental situation is not exactly what I simulated. I just simulated a 1D system. But what they had is... What's the 532? Oh, oh this is the uh, uh, wavelength of the laser. Yeah. Yeah, so, so basically uh, the, the primary lattice uh, has wavelengths 532 nanometers and the uh, detuning lattice has uh, 738 nanometers. And uh, yeah, so their system is a, a three-dimensional setup and uh, they use tight confinement to uh, partition the system into array, 2D arrays of 1D tubes. And uh, so basically I just simulate one of them. But their experimental system is a Gaussian confined so that the tubes at the uh, edge of the cloud will feel a slightly reduced uh, uh, confining potential. So we have to take into account that. So after we account for that, we indeed find a much larger intermediate phase. So this dashed line was my original simulation as pictured here. And if I account for that, this particle expansion indeed give us a much wider intermediate phase. So what's next? So there are uh, additional complications. Uh, for example, the, uh, how to measure expansion. So we, we can count accurately the, the, the position of the, uh, 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 the, the population, how much expand, but they are limited to taking images of the cloud. So to them, the best measurement is this so-called full width half maximum, meaning that uh, when they count from the edge going towards the center, and they stop when the population count reaches half the maximum count of the entire cloud. So that is the, the best they can do. But we can do much more. We can do uh, this, uh, uh, for example, the original, uh, 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 this one, this uh, particle expansion, counting how many particles go out of the initial confinement area. Or we can even calculate the, the uh, R square, meaning the, 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 in some sense the, the radius, weighted radius of the, the cloud. But the good news is that all three um, methods uh, agree uh, very well in, in theory. So, um, and uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, so it's, it is no problem that they measure this, this quantity and we, we calculate this quantity. So they are uh, equally sensitive to the localization and uh, the intermediate phase. So yeah, this, this is the localization, this is the uh, extended, and this is intermediate. So this is the, uh, uh, the result. So basically, this is the uh, theoretical simulation and this is the uh, experimental data. So uh, this is their even order imbalance. This is their particle expansion measurement. And uh, you can see that they fall off uh, at a roughly the same point. <coughs> so yeah, this is a, a, a good news that, uh, yeah, experimentally, uh, we, uh, for the first time, see the uh, uh, existence of uh, intermediate phase, meaning the coexistence of localized and extending orbitals in 1D systems. So what's, how much time do I have? Okay, okay. So yeah, let me touch briefly onto the uh, uh, implication for interaction effects. So uh, previously, uh, uh, Xiaopeng's work, uh, uh, this is a very nice work that uh, characterized what happens when you turn on interaction for this system with single particle mobility edge. And the uh, uh, understanding there is that it is possible uh, that there are still a survival of this intermediate phase. So it is characterized not by IPR, NPR, but now characterized by this uh, area law to volume law entanglement crossover and also this uh, thermal to non-thermal transition. 
And uh, the uh, exact diagonalization calculation in a small system reveal that these two transitions doesn't happen at the same energy. So this is a hint that uh, 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 many-body mobility edge or many-body intermediate phase uh, could exist. And experimentally, what they could do is that they can uh, measure the, the, the uh, decay of this uh, even all the imbalance and uh, fit it to a power law and uh, characterize this power law exponent. So basically, two questions here. So first, does MBL survive in this system with SPME? Uh, the second, do we have many body memory edge? So our current understanding is that the answer to the first question is likely confirmative. We do have MBL because the particle decay uh, does go to uh, 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 minimal. But uh, the second question is uh, inconclusive, and we need to leave it for uh, future studies. And this is the possible uh, phase diagram we, we conjecture. So, so without interaction, we have extended, localized, and intermediate. And what happens when we turn on the interaction? Well, that is still open. So, and that's all. Thank you so much. So we'll talk about quantum dots as entangled photon sources. And this work was done in Innsbruck, as Glenn already mentioned. And so uh, why would we care about quantum light sources, about entangled photon sources? So there are six major topics where you have or you might have advantage over classical protocols. Um, if you use either single photons, entangled photons, or squeezed states, and these six major topics are communication, interferometry, imaging, uh, optical quantum computing, metrology, precision measurements, and you could maybe find fundamentally new physics. And uh, if you want to have an advantage here in any of these fields, we need a source for um, non-classical light, and we're using quantum dots, and with this, I come, uh, jump in my outline. So first, I will talk about what quantum dots are and about their energy spectrum, stuff like that. Then I show you um, how we do resonant excitation, which is obviously a problem in solid state system, systems because, you, I mean, in a atoms or ions, you shine on your source and you collect from some other direction. And all the light you collect is coming from the ion. But in solid state, you always have the solid state environment. So if you shoot your laser on the system, you always get a damn load of scattered light. And so it's always a problem. Uh, so I'll show you how we, how we work around that. Uh, then I tell you what time entanglement is and how we measure it. Uh, show you some results and a brief conclusion. So quantum dot is a semiconductor structure that is confined in all three directions. So if you look at this image here, that's a DM uh, transition electron microscope image. And we see here that's uh, 50 nanometers in this dimension and 50 nanometers in this dimension. And this dark region here uh, is indium arsenide and the gray region is gallium arsenide. And this indium arsenide here forms the quantum dot. So it's, uh, it's almost round in the other direction that you don't see. And uh, it's like this little pyramid or you can think of it as a pancake that's a bit thicker in the middle, and uh, the quantum dot, so this is an AFM scan of the surface, and you see all these peaks there are quantum dots. Uh, this is out of, I mean, this axis is not their true height, but we can see that uh, they are um, randomly placed over the sample, which is uh, due to the growth process. But their size distribution is pretty, pretty good. And what happens in energy? So if you start off with just a slab of semiconductors, bulk of semiconductor, so here is plotted the position, and this is the energy. And this, this line here is the conduction band, and uh, band edge, and this uh, is the valence band uh, energy. So all these states below here are filled with electrons, and all these states up here are empty. So we can uh, excite uh, one electron from here to there. So we have an electron up here, and the hole, or the missing electron, in the valence belt, we call a, call a hole, and this is treated as a, as a particle itself because it's easier to just not deal with thousands of electrons, but just with the one hole. Uh, so if you now change from this condition to a heterojunction, that means uh, we change the material at this point in position, so we grow a lower band gap semiconductor. Um, we might get something that looks like this, depending on the band alignment. 
so if we have type one alignment, which we have, we get this potential or this, this step going down uh, and, uh, for the electrons. And this, uh, potent, uh, this uh, energy going down for the holes because the holes live kind of in an inverse world. So the energy going, going up here means uh, it's going down for the holes. And uh, if we change the material again uh, to high band gap semiconductor, we can produce a quantum dot which has uh, this uh, high band gap, low band gap, high band gap structure. And if it's confined in all three dimensions, um, when we look in our quantum mechanics one book, we have a particle in a box that's confined in all three dimensions. We get discrete energies. So instead of having uh, these energy bands here in the conduction and valence band, we get discrete energies for the quantum dot. And on these energies, we can also um, we can populate them with electrons and holes. So now not the infinite number as before in the, in the bulk case, but just uh, uh, one or two, because uh, I mean, this Pauli exclusion just allows two different spins on each level. And um, if you have one electron and one hole sitting on these quantum dot uh, levels, um, this state that's formed here has some binding as well, and we call it exciton. And I want to mention here, because it's important later, the electron has a spin of one half, which you all know. But the hole, um, uh, we uh, don't, I mean, we always talk about spin, but it's actually uh, angular momentum. And we only consider heavy holes, which have uh, angular momentum of plus or minus three half. And the other holes, which are uh, light holes and um, spin off uh, band holes, which have uh, angular momentum of one half are pushed away in energy from the confinement that we get with the quantum dot. And if we have uh, two electrons and two holes inside the quantum dot, uh, we call it a biaxidon. And uh, the biaxidon um, decays in a cascade. So if we create a biaxidon somehow by electrical bumping, resonant bumping, whatsoever, we just assume we have a biaxidon state to start with. And uh, one of the two uh, exitons will decay, sending a photon out. This we call by exciton photon. So we are left with an exciton. This is sending a photon out. This we call the exciton photon. Then we are left with the quant empty quantum dot. We can excite it again. And uh, the spectrum looks like this. So you might wonder here, the exciton line has a different energy than the by exciton line, although they live on the same level. And this is due to uh, Coulomb interactions. So the second particles just feel the first particle sitting there and and uh, we get some additional binding. And yeah, all these experiments are done at 4 Kelvin because this potential step is uh, not deep enough to do these experiments at room temperature. And uh, yeah, we, to get the bi state, we could either just flood the system with electrons by electrical pumping or uh, shining a laser on it with a very high uh, energy. But we uh, can also do resonant pumping. It has several advantages, uh, which I come to later. So what, what we do here, so this uh, schematics just has energy on this axis, and this axis it has no meaning. And we have the ground state here. Then we have two exciton states, which have uh, either spin up or spin down. Uh, so spin again here is total angular momentum. And it's just uh, the electrons spin plus the holes angular momentum. Uh, which adds up to plus or minus two or plus or minus one. And the plus or minus two spin particles are dark. They are forbidden, so we, we just don't consider them here in this experiment. And uh, the biaxidon, since it's consisting of an up and down electron in the up and down hole, all the spins cancel out, so we have uh, spin zero. And uh, the ground state is obviously spin zero because it's empty. So if we want to drive this transition to the biaxidon, uh, we cannot do that from the ground state, just of, uh, I mean, it's been, for, it's dipole forbidden. We could either send in two lasers here, one on the exciton and another one at by exciton energy. But as I mentioned before, in the semiconductor system, this totally screws you. So instead, we can use this virtual transition here and just uh, drive the system directly from the ground state to the by exciton with this two photon process. And then we end up in the Biaxidon state, and it will decay either on this side or on that side, which uh, would give us polarization tangled photons. And 
I show you, I talk about time bin index photons later because uh, um, time bin has advantages in long distance communication. If you want to send your photons through a fiber, uh, the polarization entanglement will be lost due to polarization mode dispersion, but the time bin entanglement survives. So if you want to stick to polarization entanglement, you can do satellite links, that's cool, but really expensive. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so we, we thought of why not create time bin entanglement to start with instead of creating polarization entanglement, converting it, and so on. Uh, for all of those who like to see Hamiltonians, uh, this is uh, <laughs> what we consider here. So uh, omega is the laser. Then there is some ground state to exciton coupling, some exciton to biexciton. So the laser couples uh, ground to exciton and uh, exciton to biexciton state. And this spontaneous emission with uh, delta is the detuning from the respective level. And uh, this is the spectrum we get now. So it's the same quantum dot that I showed you in the spectrum before. And uh, we see there's, I mean, it's not so much laser scatter, but it has the same strength as the signal. And uh, now the bi and the exciton are al almost balanced, which is uh, good because it means that we always create uh, uh, this pair of photons. And we have a little bit of excess exitons, which come uh, from uh, direct pumping of the exciton because it's still allowed to pump the exciton, although we're really far detuned. And we pumped the dry on as well, which I didn't show you. That's some level with another hole uh, in the ground state. So sometimes the system ends up in the ground state after we did this. We don't know why. Maybe some residual charge that drops in or so, and we excite the dry on. And uh, yeah, to show that this is really resonant and to understand also better what's going on, we did some Rabi oscillation uh, measurements. So this was our original publication. Um, what we did here is, uh, I mean, what's plotted here is the laser power of a pulsed laser versus uh, the counts that we get out, um, which are normalized. So um, the counts we get out, you could uh, think of it as the um, probability of exciting your system. Uh, the black line is the Rabi oscillation for no defacing. And we measured these four curves for different detunings. So we see that uh, we have a lot of defacing because we do not reach the black line. And uh, the Hamiltonian I showed you before, if you treat it in an op open system with, uh, with defacing, you have to put in a master equation to, to treat the system properly. But uh, if you do that, we just have one free parameter for all these four curves, which is the unknown defacing. And you can model this pretty nice. And, but we, we wondered, why does this not go down further? This is really bad, kind of. So uh, our th uh, theory group in Innsbruck came up with the idea Maybe the bump uh, produces some defacing. And we thought of how can we probe if the bump is, is defacing the system. So we repeated the same measurement, just doing a different uh, bump pulse length. So we have here three different bump width. Here is again uh, the power plotted, but now normalized uh, also with the, with the bump length to compare the data better. And I didn't plot all the data, just some sample data points. But we see that uh, if you change the pulse width, uh, it, uh, the defacing goes down. And 12 is the, mac uh, is the optimum point. So after 12 picoseconds, uh, it gets worse again for this specific uh, detunings of this specific quantum dot that we measured here. And um, yeah, with this introduction about quantum dots and resonant excitation, which seems unconnected to what I'm talking now, I jump into entanglement, but I will, uh, I will show you why this was important in, uh, in the next slide. So entanglement, simply speaking, if you have two qubits, it's just a state that cannot be written as a product of its subsystems. There are four maximally entangled states. They're called Bell states. And I uh, wrote down here one of the Bell states, the phi plus state, which is uh, 0, 0, plus 1, 1, if 0 and 1 are my uh, basis of measurement. It could be anything. Uh, for example, it could be time bin. So if I write the state down again, so this is a phi plus state, or depending on the phase, also a phi minus state, uh, I have 0, 0 plus 1, 1. I just call it early, early plus late, late here. And this state is produced simply by uh, bumping the quantum dot with such a uh, interferometer. So we have a pulse that's coming in, it's split up into two parts. 
Uh, this imbalanced interferometer introduces some time delay. We get two pulses out, and we excite a quantum dot. And what we see here is um, that there is this phase, uh, phi p, <coughs> which can, we can set in the bump interferometer with the, with the phase plate. And this uh, determines the sign of the created uh, state. So if now my excitation process is not coherent, if I just flood the system with electrons, this will be random. So if this is random, I'm never going to measure entanglement. That's why this resonant excitation was important. Um, so how do we analyze time bin? Um, in general, I mean, we'd be, uh, we decided to, to do a tomogra tomographic reconstruction to get our full state out. And in, you need for, in general, for n qubits, you need four to the n parameters. So we have two qubits here, which means we need 60, 16 parameters of our measurement. That means we need 60, 16 projective uh, measurements. And uh, uh, they need to be in orthogonal basis. So I know that the possible, possible sequence of measurements here, so you measure the biaxidon and the exciton photon, for example, in the early, early projection or in the early plus x or and so forth projection. And uh, what are these x and y states? I, I try to show you here on this uh, modified Poincaré sphere. So on this sphere, we have the early, late, early state and the late state. And on the equator, we have all the linear superpositions without imaginary phase. So and at this point, we have early plus late, which uh, is the x state. At this uh, side, we have early minus late. And here at the poles, we have uh, early plus i late and early minus i late. So with this, we can uh, have three orth orthogonal bases uh, to quantify our, our state from before. So how do we measure that experimentally? Um, so what's plotted here is the counts of one detector, if you excite the quantum dot, and how do these three peaks come, and what, how do we use them to analyze what uh, we want to analyze? So here is this, the thing I showed you before to create a state. And to analyze the state, we need these two additional interferometers, which have the same uh, path length difference than the bump interferometer to undo our, our time delay. And why do we want to undo the time delay? I'll explain you now. So if, if the quantum dot was excited by the early pulse, which is one of the states we want to analyze, and uh, it, uh, for example, the exciton photon here went through the short path here in this analyzing interferometer. So uh, it was the early pump pulse and went through the short arm. It always ends up in this bin. So we know all the photons that ending up in this bin are our early projection because they always come from the early pump pulse. If now it, uh, it was created by the la uh, late pulse and it also takes the long long analysis path, it ends up here. And we know this is always our late projection because the late will always end up here. If it, I mean, this is only, only possible to end up here if it was created from the late pulse. But if it uh, like takes short here, long there, or the opposite, then it ends up in the middle pulse. So here we don't know if it was coming from the early pump pulse or from the late pump pulse because we don't know which path it took in the analysis. So here we can measure all those other projections, which are a superposition of early and late bin. But we need to set a phase to determine which state we measure. So by setting the phase here in the interferometer, we can uh, choose the basis of measurement. So then we can say set both, both uh, plates to zero, and we measure the xx projection in this uh, central time bin. And, uh, this is the result we measured. So plotted here is a density matrix. The density matrix is defined as the state uh, multiplied with itself. And uh, if you have a mi phi minus state, then uh, this uh, corner column here should be 0 0.5. And the other, co the off diagonal corner should be minus 0 0.5. And we see this is pretty good, which have some residuals. And uh, the concurrence of this uh, state is uh, 0 0.78. So concurrence is a measure of how much entanglement you have. It's uh, 0 if you have no entanglement, and it's 1 if you're maximally entangled. And anything above 1 tells you there is some entanglement. 
So it's maybe not perfect, but there is some some part of the state is entangled. Anything above zero. Pardon? Anything above zero. Anything above zero, yeah. Anything above zero. So zero is the threshold, so that's a good number if it's uh, or it's a good quantity to to uh, measure entanglement. And fidelity just tells you of how well this matrix overlaps with your target state, which is indirectly also a measure of entanglement because if it's not entangled, it will not overlap very well, but it, I always have the feeling it just tells you more of how well you control your, I mean, your experimental uh, status or your, well, like everything, your process. And uh, so after showing you results, I want to show you a subtle detail. So uh, what we did is we created the photons probabilistically with a low probability because the actual state is not the one I showed you, but it's this one. So E is for early, L is for late. So um, we create uh, these early, early um, photons, but we also create photons in, with both pulses eventually. So if you bump the system too hard, we only get this early, late, or late. We always get four photons out. And this is a maximally mixed state. So this is absolutely not what we want to create. So we have to keep the probabilities low in order to have a lot of this state and not a lot of this state. And of course, if we keep the probabilities low, we get a lot of nothing out, which is bad in a way because you want a bright source. But uh, yeah, it, it doesn't bother us so much because we look at uh, when we have something, then we analyze it. Uh, there's a way to work around this, uh, which I leave open for questions. And uh, what we also did is, um, since I told you before, you could create polarization entanglement because you have these two paths to come down here, which is uh, this state, HH plus VV or uh, RL plus LR. And uh, if you create a time bin entangled state at the same time, you can create a hyper entangled state, which just means you have entanglement in both these degrees of freedom. And uh, yeah, the theory state should look like this, and we measured that, uh, which has a fidelity of uh, 0.55. There is no concurrence measure here, so this is all we can, all we can say. Uh, it's unpublished yet. Uh, if you want to more, uh, know more details, please talk to me or look it up or ask questions. And with this, I want to summarize. I showed you that quantum dots can be used as entangled uh, sources of entangled photon pairs. I uh, showed you how to resonantly excite the bi-exiton state, and I showed you our time bin entangled photons with high concurrence and fidelity. And, sorry, I want to thank the people <laughs> that did all this work with me. So it was in the group of Gregor Weiss. Uh, I, uh, Anna, and Max did the measurements. Uh, the cat helped a lot as well. <laughs> and it was also in a collaboration with Glenn Solomon. Thank you.